Welcome to Diversity TV. Uh, tonight, uh, as, as our mission reflects, we actually have somebody that does what we do, uh, but uh, since we're now going to be pointing the camera at him, it should be interesting, an interesting reflection. Difficult. Um, I'm your host, Mark Harris. Um, we, this is a, if you're new to Diversity TV, a welcome. Uh, if you're p part of our growing legion of fans, welcome back. We, uh, this is a oh, sort of weekly, uh, I hesitate to call it a news magazine because it's not necessarily part of the press, but uh, we, our mission is essentially to illuminate everyday diversity issues and to give the mic and the camera uh, to those who don't always get it. And uh, our guest tonight is actually one of the folks that does that too out in the community. So uh, if uh, you go to Slide Guys, we're showing the mission. And to that end, one of the things that we do, our seasons follow LCC terms, and this is the sixth term that we've been doing this, roughly almost three years. And uh, what we do uh, is usually start with a native perspective because we're on Turtle Island. Because we, the convention is to speak English, we usually start with the uh, Anglo perspective, but uh, last week we did an Obama show because uh, with our new president, so great to say that actually, this is the first show we've been able to say that, uh, we shot a video of him and crowd reaction uh, when he was here at Mac Court on the during the campaign. Uh, this week, uh, Anglo Community Perspective. Next week, Africans in America, Latino, Asian, uh, which actually should be like the week of the Asian uh, celebration here in Eugene. February 25th, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer questioning, intersex, two-spirit perspective. Uh, youth perspective, March 4th. Uh, class perspective, March 11th and uh, ending uh, the term, March 17th, Spirituality and Religion, and our guest uh, that we've just confirmed would be Grandmother Aggie. So uh, stay tuned for that, so every Wednesday night. So a friend of mine in another video company elsewhere said their motto is, the revolution will not be televised, or may not be televised, to the Gil, the Gil Scott Heron line, if you're old enough to remember who Gil Scott Heron was. It, but there will be video, some of it professionally shot. So our guest tonight is a longtime ally of health promotion and social justice issues for community of color, among others. And he's won awards, and some of his video projects include Justice on the Table, which we have a clip that we'll see tonight, uh, which is basically an educational documentary about farm workers and their efforts to unionize in Oregon. Ganas means desire, uh, a documentary on a Latino middle school mentoring program. Uh, and he's done various health promotion videos for, among others, uh, Orcas, Pregnancy Prevention Series, Keeping Babies Safe, Street Smart, Menopause Information. And he's produced and shot for ABC, the BBC, and Chinese television systems. Please uh, welcome Will Doodlittle. Hello. Good to see you Glad once again. Here. So how'd you come to Eugene? Well, my, literally my thumb brought me. I hitchhiked out here in 1971. I turned 21 out here. Um, I was just uh, coming from Rhode Island where I was, uh, was just needed a change, um, and I wanted to see the world. And I wasn't planning to stop in Eugene. I was planning to just—I I wasn't planning to, to stay in Eugene. I was going to get a job and move on. But I got a job so and stayed. So many of us, yeah. Yeah, I think right. it's happened to a lot of people. Yeah. So, uh, how long have you been shooting video and producing video? Well. Uh, it started before, uh, literally uh, since 1980, where I uh, came to LCC and got a uh, uh, started studying um, radio and and uh, photography, hmm. but then moved into the video. It's, it was the time when um, video cameras were just small, starting to get small enough to put on your shoulder, and okay. you could actually do real stuff with them. And uh, so I got my first job in 1983. Uh, 
came out of LCC. Hmm. I'm very proud of it. Graduate. It was, it's a great, right. uh, great program. It's been uh, cut back uh, a little bit, but um, some great people come out of here still. Hmm. So your projects, um, particularly those for Orcas, seem to be health oriented. What else do you like to focus on? Well, it's um, uh, I like doing anything that educates and helps people work to make the world a better place. Um, when I went into video, uh, it was coming out of being a printer, an offset printer. Mm. And my life there was devoted primarily to helping people use uh, the, the printed word and, and images to change the world. And I just kind of moved that, moved into that in video. Um, and it, 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 the, the fact that it was health really was incidental to the educational aspect of it. I just decided when I was doing video, I really didn't want to sell things per se. Okay. And I wanted to move in a direction of um, helping change the world. And, and fortunately, I've been really lucky to have a, a couple of main clients who can keep me busy enough to um, have a business make some money, pay the rent, and, and also use my time to um, and, and resources to help other things and create other projects. Mm. So um, what attracts you to a potential project? Uh, well, to me it has to have some basis of change, changing the world. Um, I mean, if, if a client comes in the door and says they want to do something, I usually just evaluate it uh, by, uh, is it going to not be negative in the world scope, and, uh, and will it be interesting? Uh, but I anything that I put our resources to and my own personal energy to uh, has to really be something that can help change the world is on some level. And um, so things like uh, justice issues, uh, immigration issues, um, uh, youth uh, empowerment, um, uh, farm workers, workers in general, uh, the environment, native, indigenous issues. I've, done something on, on all those and more. Hmm. Let's uh, look at the, uh, the, the, the clip that I, uh, well, personally, not just, I think it's the one that's uh, up first in the queue, um, was uh, the video that you shot for the recent Martin Luther King celebration. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at that. Isn't it true that we have often taken necessities from the masses to give luxuries to the classes? Isn't it true that we have often in our democracy trampled over the individuals and races with iron feet of oppression? Isn't it true that through our Western powers we have perpetuated colonialism and imperialism? If we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people. The giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. There is nothing except a tragic death wish to prevent us from reordering our priorities. So that the pursuit of peace will take precedence over the pursuit of war. 
We are now faced with the facts, my friends, that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. Unity is the great need of the hour. And if we are united, we can get many of the things that we not only desire, but which we justly deserve. Don't let anybody frighten you. There is never a time in our American democracy that we must ever think we are wrong when we protest. Let us be dissatisfied until the tragic walls that separate the outer city of wealth and comfort from the inner city of poverty and despair shall be crushed by the battering rams of the forces of justice. Let us be dissatisfied until those who live on the outskirts of hope are brought into the metropolis of daily security. Let us be dissatisfied. Let us be dissatisfied until slums are cast into the junk heaps of history and every family will live in a decent sanitary home. Let us be dissatisfied until the dark yesterdays of segregated schools will be transformed into bright tomorrows of quality, integrated education. Let us be dissatisfied. Let us be dissatisfied until integration is not seen as a problem, but as an opportunity to participate in the beauty of diversity. Let us be dissatisfied until men and women will be judged on the basis of the content of their character not on the basis of the color of their skin. And we can answer with creative, nonviolence the, the call to higher ground to which new directions of our struggle summons us. The road ahead is not altogether a smooth one. There are no broad highways to lead us easily and inevitably to, to quick solutions. But we must keep going. Keep moving. Let nothing slow you up. Move on with dignity and honor and respectability. Keep going today. Keep moving amid every obstacle. Keep moving amid every mountain of opposition. If you will do that with dignity, when the history books are written in the future, the historians will have to look back and say, there lived a great people. We must use time creatively. And the knowledge that the time is always ripe to do right. Now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. Now was the time to lift our national policy from the quicksand of racial injustice to be solid rock of human dignity. I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. I believe that even amid today's motor bursts and whining bullets, there is still hope for a brighter tomorrow. I believe that wounded justice can be lifted from this dust of shame to reign supreme among the children of men. I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere debe tener tres comidas al día para su cuerpo. Education and culture for their minds. And dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. Somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friend, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream.
Well, if a still picture, like the Chinese proverb tells us, is worth a thousand words, well, I'd say that a good piece of video is definitely worth several terabytes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Um, I mean, as, a, as an amazing piece of, I guess, sadhyagraha, peaceful weapon, or, you know, grasping hold of truth, I mean, uh, what I liked about that, I mean, when you first, uh, you know, approached me, and I guess, you know, everybody donated their time? Yeah, uh, all the staff, all the uh, production crew. Um, I paid uh, Moving Image Production staff to, on the production, pre-production end of it, um, and the editing time, but beyond that, everybody donated their time. To, and uh, Chambers Production donated the studio, and uh, I, we neglected to credit uh, Orcus, Oregon Center for Applied Science, for donating the teleprompter. Cool. So, uh, yeah, okay. it was a right. community effort. It was great. really great. Yeah. Um, I particularly liked, uh, because I didn't really get to stay, I didn't stay for the, at the celebration, so I actually, this is the first time I've actually seen it full length on a, mm -hmm. you know, on the screen, the small screen, as it were. Um, but I particularly liked, you know, the clips and, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing a the making of video because, yeah. you know, knowing all, you know, living in this community and knowing some of the backstory behind some of the individuals as well as, you know, when they deliver particular lines. Like, for example, you know, one you know, like you started with the bounce check speech at the bounce check section, mm -hmm. which, you know, I really love because, you know, <clears throat> talking about, okay, when Martin called it the bounce check speech and everybody in the first few years of the celebration here referred to it as the bounce check speech and why, and they, you know, express their bewilderment. What is this? I have a dream they're talking about because <laughs> were we there or not? You know, it's about, you know, the check bounced and, mm -hmm. You know, that's the central point. And, you know, the I have a dream section was really a riff, as it were, you know, to, to carry it out. So squarely putting, you know, social justice and also looking at, you know, the thousand or terabyte worth of words aspect that, okay, this is an American and we are Americans and the face of America is diverse. Yeah. And so, you know, this isn't just the you know, black holiday or excuse me audience, but you know, I have to say this in vernacular because you know, we've heard this in this community enough, you know, nigger day, you know, it's not just <laughs> nigger day, it's an American holiday, you know, this is what America is about. And so when you have people, you know, <clears throat> like, uh, um, and I'm just gonna, you know, single out L Linda because she's been an integral, integral part of the uh, committee, mm -hmm. You know, she, you know, that first line that she delivers, I mean, she's the one who definitely had to speak up because part of her history was, you know, as a, a prison guard encountering discrimination, you know, because of her race and gender, you know, in the Oregon, you know, by her fellow officers, right? And so dared to complain about it and then gets moved to Lane County in parole and probation and again, you know, gets... <laughs> Uh, active uh, discrimination, you know, uh, targeted against her and continues to stand up and, uh, you know, to the degree that that's been resolved. So it's basically about, you know, speaking up. Yeah. And uh, all those different voices and even, you know, ASL and Spanish and, you know. We tried to get all of that in there. And I mean, we start from the premise that um, Martin Luther King his words are really only known as, like you say, my, I have a dream. That's the only uh, segment of any speech that ever gets repeated, but he talked about so many issues that are so relevant even today about uh, racism and militarism and, uh, and uh, the treatment of the poor at the, uh, to the benefit of the rich. And uh, he just, he laid it all down and uh, people forget about that. And um, or are never told about it. And so we felt it was important to, to uh, I, I started from the point of view of let's try to get those words out there. And then how can we do that? Well, let's get the whole range of people, as many, just a, a, a range of people as mu much as we can to, to bring this out. And uh, we chose a day to shoot and contacted people and brought everybody to one place uh, and, and ran them through. and 
caught you a little bit later because uh, you, we had a miscommunication, but uh, it was so great to have you part of it because you really made, made that part that you did strong, and that was good. Thank you. It was fun. I mean, I, and I thought I was particularly intrigued by, you know, the, that cutting technique of mm -hmm. having the lines delivered multiple times in multiple voices, and each one is different. And, yeah. you know, when you, what do you find useful about the medium of video, you know, in all those, I mean, I'm sure I didn't see all your little tricks in yeah. there, but. Yeah. Well, it's a powerful medium, and uh, uh, like any art, medium any medium can be powerful uh, video is particularly powerful because I think it it I think it kind of mimics dreams uh, and um, it goes into a place where your mind works with it and um, it's it, it can be really powerful and I think that those in power in the world know that and have been able to use it very, very effectively and for me and uh, our group, uh, we just feel it's a way to, to use these tools uh, to make changes for the good. Yeah. It's interesting that you say mimic dreams, and I think we'll come back to that. Because um, um, I mentioned before we got on camera, and I'll just mention it briefly now before we go to the next clip. Um, there was a book uh, written by a television ad executive uh, named Jerry Mander, really his name. He used to work for, I think, Ogilvy and Mather or something like that back in the day. And he wrote this great book called uh, Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television. And within the four arguments, there are 10 sub-arguments each, right? Very well detailed, you know. And he, he talks about that ability for, of television to get in, you know, past your conscious filters into your subconscious mind where dreams are and kind of affect, you know, subconscious attitudes and things like that. Um, let's do the next one about justice on the table, because I think, you know, in terms of bringing up people who we rarely think about, literally, I mean, the whole illegal immigration question always gets down to mm -hmm. brown people, wait, who are putting food on your table and doing the work that you don't want to do yourself or can't do yourself, and, you know, let's look at that justice piece. Good. And they should know that it's the third one on the, uh, on the list, on the DVD. As a consumer, I think we all have a responsibility, first of all, just to be more aware and conscious of where our food comes from. Because for most of us, our food comes from Safeway, Albertsons, you know, Kroger's. We don't think too much about where it's grown and who picks it and under what conditions. So the first step is just to stop and to ask those questions. Where does this product come from? Who is picking it? If we eat fruits and vegetables, we eat food that was hand-picked, a lot of it, by farm workers. And those farm workers are, are largely immigrants these days. And their life expectancy now is about 48 years old in a, in a country where the life expectancy is uh, in the 70s for most of the rest of us. Something's wrong with that picture. Farm workers are paying a price, right, to put food on the American table. And the consuming public's got to understand that, that farm workers can no longer uh, afford um, to live and be treated that way. The United States pays less for food than any other industrialized nation in the world, and it's not right that it should be on the backs of these people who are working in the hot sun, 
um, doing all these things to, to get the food to our tables. I mean, I think it's just an absolute travesty that we continue getting food that they're paying for by their sweat and blood. Hay muchas condiciones malas, por ejemplo, está uno trabajando a medio fil y no ponen agua, entonces anda uno con sed y no ponen agua. Los baños muchas veces ya están llenos y inclusive a veces no tienen ni baños. Y, este, y si la gente anda a medio fil, hasta el final el otro fil tiene que venir hasta acá, hasta el otro lado del fil, caminar como media milla o menos de media milla o hasta más, inclusive una milla o más para hacer sus necesidades fisiológicas. Y, este, y en eso le están también corriendo el tiempo. Y en algunas ocasiones a los mayordomos les gritan, les regañan, los tratan como si fueran unos animales y eso no tiene que ser, no tiene que pasar eso. Yo de trabajo, ¿no? El mayordomo me trata pues más o menos, a veces me dice que sana babis, ¿no? Que malas palabras a mí. Cuando uno está trabajando bien y a veces llega uno ahí, ¡paz! Una patada y es el mes gabacho. Llega y ¡saz! Una patada, a veces ¡saz! En la cabeza, así, ¿no? Y eso saca de onda, ¿no? Pues uno viene enojado acá, pues ¿qué? Pues ¿qué trae? Esto no gusta y luego ahí está, y luego algo que no le parece, luego le dice, oh, ¿quieres ir para tu casa? Dale, vete. No, sí, tuve problemas con algunos rancheros porque eh, explotan a, al trabajador, porque como uno no sabe realmente cómo están las leyes aquí en este estado, o, o los sueldos, o el temor de que pierda uno el trabajo y qué voy a hacer, tengo que mandar dinero a México, mantener mi familia, o es... A veces se aguanta uno pues a la explotación. We just talked to several of the workers here and it, apparently it's very clear that that the workers here are very scared, they're intimidated. We went upstairs to talk to one worker and um, it was uh, clear that they were not even making minimum wage here, but they won't complain. And in fact, uh, this guy that we talked to earlier, he asked me a question whether what he made in a day Uh, had to be the equivalent of $6.50 an hour times eight hours. And he had worked 10 hours and wasn't even making minimum wage. So I told him by law, you have to make at least minimum wage, whether you're paying by piece rate or whether you're paying by the hour. You know, you still have to make minimum wage. The labor camps are down dirt roads. They're on private property. You, you do not see how the people live who are the folks that are putting the food on our tables. And it's awful. Even the best labor camp is pretty bad. And lots of them are nothing short of a disgrace. El ranchero le brinda, le brinda este, pues, casa, pero realmente no es casa, sino es, es este, una galera hecha por lámina nada más. Y, donde lo ocupa como garage, donde guarda su herramienta y todo lo que no le sirve, ¿no? Y ahí mete dos, tres familias, pues, y eso es lo que les brinda él a, a la persona, pues, las personas que, que llegan a trabajar con él. Pues por ese lado es un poco malo, ¿no? Cruzamos dos primas hermanas y el esposo de ella, de una de ellas, él fue el coyote para nosotros. Caminamos dos días en el cerro, todo un día sin comer y sin tomar agua. Después llegamos a una casa, únicamente la señora nos ofreció agua, no nos, nos ofreció comida. Nos pasamos todo un mediodía sin, sin, tomando una más agua. The border crossing stories are permanent and they're very etched in people's mind and the experience of being undocumented, of being illegal and being sort of labeled and really racialized in that sense really sticks with people. Um, even after they're legalized, people don't forget that and they still understand the way people look at them and the way they perceive them. Sufriría menos pues el, el inmigrante. Y al tener documentos o, o venir contratado por cierta temporada ya con la seguridad de que no va a tener problemas para abrir una cuenta en el banco, para mandar dinero a su familia, pues, porque para todo eso el inmigrante no tiene esas garantías. We have a set of laws that basically says there's no room for people. 
We invest enormous resources and spend tremendous effort in keeping people out. And at the same time, we have an economy which is saying, well, actually, there is room. But if you're willing to assume all the risks, the risk of dying in the desert or in the mountains, the risk of being caught and sent back, um, the risk of working and living under a different set of standards and conditions than the rest of the American workforce, if you're willing to take all the risks, we, in fact, need you in this economy. So we need an immigration law which acknowledges the truth that our laws have so far failed to acknowledge that there is room economically for people and that we are better off and they are better off if we endow these people with their rights, um, with full access to labor rights, full ability to join unions and you know the ability to complain when their labor rights are violated and that really means providing them access to legal status. Esa es una situación muy triste porque nosotros aparentemente vivimos felices aquí, pero eso es una mentira. Porque todos los días uno se levanta con la preocupación de que hoy salí a trabajar y es posible que no regrese. Y tenemos hijos que necesitan de nosotros, que dependen de nosotros. Eh, es un riesgo que corre uno. Y no somos criminales. Eh, cometimos un delito, sí. Lo acepto, al entrar aquí legalmente, pero es un, como llaman aquí, es un delito pequeño a comparación de muchos delitos graves que cometen otras personas, ¿no? Entonces nosotros el delito es venir a querer vivir bien, conseguir una forma de vida más digna, de comer lo que nunca hemos comido. O sea, venimos a, a buscar este, vivir bien y a la vez contribuir. We begin and end with food and food for thought. Um, so, at nine minutes... And that's two excerpts out of a 20-minute piece. Two excerpts out of a 20-minute piece. Um, how often is this issue covered by network? Oh, well, well look. <laughs> I'd say never. <laughs> with this, you know, I recognize the areas, right? So this is within an hour and a half of where we're sitting right now. Yeah. Okay, so conceivably. Our home state. Our home state. Conceivably, um, any one of the network news organizations could cover this story. Yeah, it's. Because um, they all eat. It's neglected. It's ignored. Uh, and it's always put in. in it's always framed in these um, sensationalistic terms or, or uh, we always have to call people uh, illegal in order to talk about them. We can't talk about them as working people or, or human beings. And it's, it's tough. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, the, the dehumanization aspect, you know, comes across clear in their stories. You know, illegals. Okay, well, right, but they're feeding you, right? So, and 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 guess what? They're living, they're feeding you, and living in conditions that none of you would stand for. Wouldn't allow your pet to live in that well, condition. Well, right, a chicken coop with all the tools and farm equipment, and you're housing three families in a chicken coop. That's essentially a garage. So, mm. uh, yeah, I thought slavery was over. But slavery has returned it's, to the United States, and even though yeah. they may or may not be getting paid minimum wage, right? I mean, yeah, this it, slice is not even the worst of what happens in this country, but it, it is happening within an hour and a half of where we are, so... Yeah. Yeah, and most of them it, uh, can't complain. Uh, the job is too important to them. They have families to, to, um, to care for, and yeah. So we felt it was important to, to do that, to, to tell that story and um, pointed the camera in that direction. And, and uh, Marian Malcolm, who uh, is one of the interviewees we saw, um, she just told me today she got a letter from a teacher who showed this to her elementary school kids. And they all wrote letters to, uh, uh, by email, um, she, the teacher sent her, um, Marion, this series of questions and, and statements about how they want to help the farm workers and what can they do. And it was uh, bilingual kids, uh, mm, and uh, it was really encouraging. 
It'll be interesting to see what happens with that and then also, I mean, with the entire issue. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, in one sense, you know, I mean, I'm looking at it from the native point of view. It's like, wait a minute, there wasn't no border. These people were welcome here before there was an alphabet in English. Yeah. So <laughs> illegal yeah. who? Right. Like, you know, I mean, I remember sitting in a airport, well, in Reagan National, you know, um, watching, this is early in the campaign, so the woman sitting next to me was for Hillary, and you know, it was a CNN thing, you know, on illegal aliens or whatever, and she was saying, yeah, well, we've got a couple of illegal aliens, they're like Canadians, and you know, one's from Europe, and you know, they're working in our law office, and they're making $80,000 and they're here illegal, illegally, ha, 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 right? Yeah, so, isn't that cute? Yeah, well, half a million <laughs> Europeans and Canadians, you know, here illegally, making, you know, oh, yeah. they're taking living wage jobs from Americans, but nobody's looking that's for them. Come, that's not an issue. Right, no. they're not looking, living in chicken coops. Yeah. So, you know, and performing work that isn't as critical as, you know, putting fruits and vegetables on your table, yeah. so. There's yeah. some structural injustice going on. Yeah, so. Um, the dehumanization piece, um, I think, uh, definitely, you know, cries out, you know, to me in terms of looking at and, you know, looking at the whole native piece, the sovereignty piece, um, the work that uh, your wife, Misa Jo, t talks about in terms of dealing with the Winnem and Wintu and their sovereignty issues, which is, again, in our backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious to see what you did with that in terms of treatment, in terms of aiming, aiming the camera. Yeah. So, so yeah. that's our cue, guys. Okay. This is our home. No matter who owns it, no matter what people come in and say they own it, this is still where the sacred rocks are. This is still where the eagle flies. This is still where the Winnemums come. We're the people that pray and sing for the water. We don't pray and sing for the water just for us. We sing and pray for those people that are downstream from where the water sources are. That's our job. We were put here on earth to do that. We are the water people. Winnemem means middle water. In July 2006, the Winnemum Wintu tribe came together to hold their first coming of age ceremony since the 1920s. They gathered at their traditional ceremonial grounds on the McLeod River at the tip of the Shasta Lake Reservoir. This here is, is an old village site. You know, the, the dance grounds that are here, the sacred rock that's over there that, where the house is. And all along here are sacred places that are all connected to this mountain right here that the men climb and come down and swim in the pools on the river. This lake was designed, you know, way back in the 1915s. It was already thought of that that'd be a great place to put a lake. It could be the largest lake ever. And already our people had over 4,800 acres of allotment land on this river all the way down to Kennet and all the way up. And they got that 4,800 acres away from the Indians by promising to give them like land to live on. But, of course, it was during the war. Our, our guys went and fought in the war. A lot of the women who were capable went and worked in the, the manufacturing companies making war uh, materials. And, and they just, you know, never, never, some of them never came home. And the ones who did come home, came home to this. No home, all underwater, all the people gone. No place to go. It wasn't like, oh, we moved your folks over there. They live over here now. Should have been here, but it's not here. This ceremony is being held for Ymem Sis Franco, who will spend four days on the other side of the river, sleeping in a cedar bark house, praying, and learning from the elder women. Tribal members and guests make preparation for a joyful community celebration. Hey, Noor! Hoi, Pam! My Pam! Nam Pam! 
<laughs> An ore palm. Look who went through. Holly Pod, look the palm. She talks about this good fire, the sacred fire here. How it uh, cleans the land. <coughs> she called out that, the eagle and asked that eagle to look into our heads and our hearts. My grandma was one of the people on the river, you know, come from a long line of people on the river. And uh, she was born in 1910 and experienced the whole taking of everything. That she became a, an Indian activist and fought for the California Indian land claims case. She was one of those people that would go to Sacramento and wherever she yeah, needed to go, anyways, and you know they'd work. sleep in their cars. They had no money, and now she's like 96, and she's got Alzheimer's, and we're still not federally recognized. We still are fighting to even have this okay, ceremony. My generation, we got, you know, interested in Indian politics and, you know, followed it and kept fighting it. It's part of who we are, it's part of our life. You can't let it go. We're disrespecting our ancestors when we stop being Indian. What did they fight for? What did they survive for? We're still here. We still know our traditions. It would be like shame on us for not doing them. And the cool thing is, the people that were gone, my dad's generation, they're coming back. And how I see it is like the Winnemum Wintu people are like the salmon. We are salmon people, you know what I mean? That as salmon people, salmon always come home. They do everything they can to make it up the river to get back home. The water is our lifeblood. It comes from our Genesis place up on Mount Shasta and runs down the McLeod River watershed. But it's not just our water, it's the water for everyone. It's not a commodity. The water is not something that you can sell. It's not something that you can own. But it is something that's a part of you and you're a part of it. We attach a bapha tamoy to uh, the young lady that's a gift from all of the women of the village and friends that care for her and want to help her in any of her journey that she needs advice. You know, I hope we can get more of these kinds of things back. You know, way back when, I, I don't think they're really called ceremonies. It was like uh, not an everyday occurrence, but it may happen all the time. You got all kinds of kids in the village, and they're, you know, they're coming of age, and just it's time. And we would do our dances for her and sing our songs for her, and and probably you know give her presents and, and things like that. We're surrounded by spiritual things, you know, like this mountain here has a spirit of its own, and it's just that places have their own spirits, and then there's the animal spirits who also come. So when you do these kinds of dances, it kind of centers and brings, you know, the people and these spiritual things together. The future generations, they're going to remember what was done at this ceremony. They're going to remember this. It's in their blood. It's in them. And this is what gives the tribe the strength to carry on, to continue to do our jobs, to help the river, help the otters, help the salmon, eagles, all of them, to continue doing their jobs. Our struggle is your struggle. We pray for everybody, whether you're a Winnemum Wintu or you're not. We are trying to save you in the greater population, to save what you need for your generations too. We have been given the voice. This is the gift that the salmon gave to people, is the voice to speak to each other. 
And so now that's what we're trying to do is to help other people understand you know, how important rivers are to all life. Wow. Um, so obviously that was done with um, the permission of the tribal members to show those ceremonies, because that's usually not done. Yeah. They, um, there are certain uh, parts of it they didn't want taped, but they also, it's a matter of trust, um, and uh, they know that I wouldn't put anything out that um, wasn't approved by them. Um, uh, we don't. Uh, anything that I do, uh, I show to them first, and they say that's okay. And we did actually do a qu quite a bit of editing. There's a longer version that that has more songs in it uh, that you can hear better, and they um, want that only to be shown with the uh, accompaniment of a tribal person or somebody who they approve of speaking for that, so that those songs don't just get out there because yeah, there's right. been issues with that. Right. Um, <laughs> certainly I know with um, the issue of people, you know, doing cultural appropriation or sometimes, you know, as it's referred to as cultural theft, yeah. where, mm -hmm. um, where you look at, uh, on my very machine, you know, in iTunes, so, you know, there's a Jim Pepper song where Jim Pepper, you know, Native yeah. American uh, Jazz saxophonist jazz, uh -huh. was encouraged, you know, by a black jazz player to okay, yeah, sing your songs or whatever. So you know, he's done that on a couple of number, you know, a couple of tunes, you know, uh, in you know, his native voice or whatever, so to speak. And then you know, Brewer and Shipley take the song and becomes Wichitaito, and they you know, you know, I mean, they do an interesting thing with it musically. But again, you know, then that becomes the version that's known and sung around. You know, a thousand right. hippie campfires. You know, yeah. the rainbow gathering, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Yeah. Uh, so taken out of the original cultural context. So, what do they use the video for? What do they want to use the video for? Well, their immediate, uh, their immediate uh, issue for them is restoration, uh, getting restored as a tribe. Um, federal recognition. Federal. Yeah. Uh, they. Uh, Are they a recognized state? Well, Cal California went through a process of basically throwing people off the rolls uh, because it's in California, the, the federal government, BIA, threw California Indians off the rolls after a legal suit was uh, decided in favor of, uh, it's kind of complicated, but basically, uh, I think is 90% of the recognized uh, people who weren't uh, expected to be have a land base necessarily. They, they were recognized and they had services by the federal government um, basically because they're recognized as Indians who, who had treaty rights and were, were given services. They were thrown off the rolls uh, in an executive decision and there's been no lawsuit to challenge that. Uh, people are very poor and don't have the resources to challenge it. it. It should be challenged, but basically, now the Winnemum, as a tribe, aren't a recognized people, mm. and um, because they they didn't have a land base. Well, wait a uh, minute. Did I hear correctly that they did have a land base? Well, they had a land base, but they go off to fight for the country. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and they come back, it's, and your land base is under Shasta Lake, you know, yeah. for recreation and people getting yeah. drunk in the summer. Uh, am I missing something there? Yeah, is that it, accurate? it wasn't a, it wasn't an official land base. It wasn't recognized in a treaty as this is your place, and uh, you have a right to it from time immemorial, mm. uh, because the treaties that they did sign were secretly uh, uh, ignored, and they were never ratified. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, there's injustice there. Yeah. The other thing that you're using the, these videos for is around the issue of water, uh, which they feel is uh, the, their, uh, their central spiritual uh, purpose is to um, maintain the health of water, which is, of course, to all our benefit. Well, and, you know, the, uh, the clarification that they talked about was, okay, starting, we're water people, okay, our job here, we were put here, 
uh, to and given voice by the salmon to pray for everybody, not just for us, especially around water issues, and that water is not a commodity. And because I was passing through, because um, when you know Carlotta was it Carlotta Carlene, Kaleen, Kaleen, yes. Uh-huh. Uh, was here at the law conference a couple of years ago and talked about Nestle, and I didn't know, oh, Arrowhead Water yes. is Nestle. Yeah, oh, many and Nestle labels. is basically trying to negotiate for getting the headwaters around McLeod exactly. and for a bottling plant. Yeah, uh, and they're and still taking doing billions of gallons of water, which essentially will destroy the aquifer. Yeah for, you know, the city of McLeod, et cetera, et cetera. Not that, you know, okay, so if the natives don't even recognize, well, well, that's quaint, but, you know, the decision is in. <laughs> right. That's the thing with recognition comes the right to sit at the table mm-hmm. and to be represented, to have representation in those discussions. They, they show up and they speak, but there's the, uh, there is uh, federal um, rules that require that recognized peoples uh, sh- need to be listened to, and so uh, that's the other benefit of recognition right. is that they can sit at the table as equals instead of having to always kind of fight their way in in the door. Hmm. If uh, well, for those of us, those of you within the sound of our voice and sight, you might want to write a letter to the president to extend uh, rec- recognition. Yes. To the Winneman people, because, yeah. well, you know, that they should be at the table. The California legislature uh, passed a resolution uh, approving that and saying, uh, saying they should be recognized. Uh, so they're looking to their senators and Congress people to pick that up nas- uh, on a federal level and, and do something about it. And uh, Colleen, I should say Colleen uh, Cisfranco and Mark Cisfranco, Mark Franco will be here in Eugene at this year's PIELC conference as well, so people should look to that. When, that's that's um, shortly, isn't it? I want to say March. Okay. Not, I can't remember if it's March or April. Well, so one of the things that I think that's also powerful about this particular piece that kind of speaks to uh, uh, one of the th- contrary to what uh, Mander talked about in his book, uh, because his follow-up to uh, four arguments for the elimination of television was in the absence of the sacred. Mm-hmm. Uh, the survival, uh, the failure of technology and the survival of Indian nations. And he, what he said about that book was, you know, the idea was he wanted to do for technology what the previous book did about television, that is, examine it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because one of the things that he talked about in the first book is around native sovereignty issues. Oh, really? I didn't read was, uh, for example, he talked about a clip in which Grandfather David, who was keeper of Hopi prophecy at the time, about, you know, over a century old, right? Um, and uh, another Hopi who, you know, dressed in a suit and tie, who was advocating for selling the Hopi land and mineral rights to Peabody Coal Company or, you know, one of these energy companies. And who comes off better on television? Uh, yeah. Right, cultural because, pre- predisposition. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, you know he talks about you know the traditional talks about his relationship to the land and you know so there's a pan of the land with a little voiceover of Grandpa David, you know, and then there is you know the slick Indian you know in the suit who basically says oh well we can do things to improve the tribe and yeah. you know build schools and da 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 no but you're destroying the land base and. Yeah. You know, creating pollution and you know people dying from you know the secondary effects of the pollution from what you're doing yeah so you know there's those competing issues that don't necessarily get talked about within the context yeah um, any final thoughts well um, you know, for me I think it's just important for uh, for people uh, non Anglo people, people of European background, I think it's important for us to uh, really consider our place in the world and uh, the privilege that we have attained uh, unfairly um, at other people's benefit. And I think that um, for me, it's really been important to uh, use any skills I attain um, to help change that injustice in the world, uh, which 
has effects in, in health and in financial uh, areas. Uh, so many, so many uh, things need to be worked on, and I just think that each of us needs to look at our own lives and see where we can um, put our energies to make the world a better place. Well, thank you. Thank you. you I love this show. This, it's a great program. You've done a great contribution to it. If you've liked what you've seen and uh, want to see more, email us at liveclass at lanecc.edu. This has been Diversa TV. I'm Mark Harris with Will Doolittle. And go well, stay well. Mm -hmm.